not a dividend. It's a tale of two fun. Now, your losses are on someone else's balance sheet. Generally speaking, airdrops are kind of pointless anyways. Um, um, unnamed trading firms who are very involved. Um, Alec.eth is the ultimate ponzi. DeFi protocols are the antidote to this problem. Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Chopping Block. Every couple of weeks, the four of us get together and give the industry insider's perspective on the crypto topics of the day. So first, quick intros. We've got Tom, the DeFi maven and master of memes. Next, we've got Robert, the crypto connoisseur and captain of Compound. Then we've got Tarun, the giga brain and grand poobah at Gauntlet. And finally, I'm Asib, the head hype man at Dragonfly. So we are early stage investors in crypto, but I want to caveat that nothing we say here is investment advice, legal advice, or even life advice. Please see choppingblock.xyz for more disclosures. Okay, boys. We are back at 30K. It seems like all of a sudden markets had a, a, a sign of life. Things are up again, despite all the SEC attacks against crypto and all, you know, all these things being supposedly unregistered securities. And we're, you know, the market is trying to figure out where this stuff is coming from. And Tarun had a theory. Uh, Tarun, can you explain to us why markets are up so much? Um, well, cryptocurrency's favorite astrologer is, is back in action. Marin Altman is putting out a, a new natal chart as a soul bound nft it must be it must be the the reason everything's going up is there a naval chart as in natal, like your n-a-t-a-l i don't even know what that is I've never what does that mean of naval. yeah it's like a birth it, chart it's a birth it's chart, a birth right? chart. Yeah. oh so what it means like what month you're wait how does this relate to prices or crypto at all yeah, aren't prices universal? Like, ever, no matter where you're born, you asked the price me the for same? my thesis, and I okay. I chose a random <laughs> tweet that I saw today. Okay, which was, you know, got it. So because Mercury Not only is that, a retrograde, it's, like ja it's generated on chain. Can you believe oh, it? It's like amazing. generative generative astrology. You had generative AI recently, but now we've moved for forward. We're on generative. Own astrology. your astrology. Own your astrology. Okay, we're clicking through this. Uh, hold on, you gotta you gotta figure out what. What price prediction this is going to give us? I have. I don't, don't ask me. Tom is going to mint one of these live. But but the more most interesting thing for people who don't know is like during the bull market, she did give a lot of price predictions from her astrological insights. How do they do? I don't know. I don't think any of them did well, but I okay. have no clue. <laughs> like it's it's hard to beat the market when you're relying on astrological signs. I'll say that 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 I think we can say with some confidence. I am surprised there has never been a coin that's, you know, there's tons of coins based on like random astronomical things like, well, Cosmos, for instance, but I've never seen anyone go straight for the astrology thing. But I feel like if you did that. What, wasn't the, uh, Jay's new project uh, from Cosmos? Jay's, uh, what was it called? Virgo project or Libra project? Well, there was Libra literally. No, and there was yeah, Jay's And there's Gemini. But there's. But yes, none of them yes. leaned into the astrology. They like they just like happened to choose particular, you know. In the Gemini case, it was about the twins, not the astrology, right? I think the the astrology gets you in the door, but if you go too hard on the astrology, I think you start scaring people <laughs> but, away. But it's like dog <laughs> coins are a form of astrology. If, if you lean all the way into <laughs> astrology, you definitely do not have segregated customer accounts. That's like the one rule that I can assure you <laughs> for exchanges. But you don't think dog coins are sort of feel like astrology, right? Where it's like whichever dog coins the flavor of the month is suddenly like it, people give you some retroactive reason for why it happens and like they pretend it's causal, but you know, obviously who knows? Yeah. Well, okay. So g g taking a step back, the real reason why markets are up so much is because not just because Mercury is in retrograde, but also that BlackRock filed for an ETF, a Bitcoin ETF. Now, uh, if you haven't been following crypto, you might not understand why this is a big deal. So uh, there, there have been many, many attempts to try to create a Bitcoin spot ETF in uh, the US. Um, there are other countries that have sort of exchange traded products for, for Bitcoin, but the US, the SEC has always denied any Bitcoin spot ETF products, uh, although they have approved Bitcoin futures ETF products. And this has been a point of contention for the industry, which is that uh, part of the reason why it is difficult for retail investors to get access to Bitcoin is that they cannot buy it in a normal broker's account very easily the way that you could with an ETF. And a lot of institutions are unable to buy it very easily without getting on board into something like Coinbase, which of course is currently under you know attack for their business model by the SEC. So uh, there have been many attempts by different groups to try to create Bitcoin ETFs, but they've all been um, shot down by the SEC over the last you know three or four years. Uh, but BlackRock just filed an ETF kind of out of nowhere. Nobody, this didn't seem to be on anybody's radar. Uh, and BlackRock, of course, is the largest asset manager in the world. Um, they they have trillions of assets under management. They are absolutely massive. 
And they also have a pretty incredible record of getting ETF approved. And so there's a lot of speculation now in the market that this BlackRock ETF filing means that this ETF is going to get approved. I think out of 400 plus ETF applications that BlackRock has made, only once have they ever not been approved. Uh, and the last time that happened was like in 2007 or something. It was a very, very long time ago. So this, th this seems to imply that BlackRock knows something the rest of the market doesn't. And basically immediately on the heels of that, we saw Invesco, which is also a large ETF manager, Wisdom Tree and Valkyrie all file their ETF applications. Uh, we also saw the GBTC, that's the uh, Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. We saw the NAV, uh, the, the, the discount to NAV, meaning, you know, this, this was a lot of the, the origin of the 3AC blow up and all the stuff that was going on, which is that this trust, which does not allow redemptions, unlike an exchange traded product, this, uh, this trust doesn't allow redemptions. So when it trades below par, there's no way to actually get it back into par using arbitrage. Um, that gap is closing. So it's now down to 33%, which is a local high. Um, on speculation that if this BlackRock ETF gets approved, then it's also very likely that the GBTC ETF gets approved as well, or the conversion into an ETF gets approved, and therefore that this Grayscale Trust is going to get unlocked and that discount is going to go away. That seems to be driving a lot of excitement about crypto, and it seems to run very counter to the feeling in the air that we all had just a couple of weeks ago, which is this kind of gloominess in the U.S. that institutions are going to back off, that crypto is kind of dead, U.S. is going to be pushing things overseas. How, how do you guys see this story and how does it fit into your picture of what crypto is doing in the U.S. now that you have BlackRock filing for a Bitcoin ETF? Well, from what I've heard, and again, I'm not an expert, um, but what I've heard from others is that, you know, there's a speculation that all of this, these ETF applications were filed in response to expectations that the Grayscale, Grayscale lawsuit is going to result in Grayscale being approved via, you know, judicial action. And that, you know, if Grayscale is approved or there's the expectation that it's going to be approved, then everyone else wants to get in line quickly. Now, the thing that's really surprising is that everybody that Hasib already mentioned, like all of the biggest players on earth, pretty much all came out at the exact same time with their applications. And this is actually the most surprising thing because, you know, it would have required all of them to have done a lot of work before this point. You know, creating an application is not an overnight process. It's a lengthy process that has a lot of legal time and expense that goes into it, all of the different applications clearly must have been ready to go previously. Um, and so either all of these sponsors were just waiting for some sign and they all, you know, just immediately follow. Astrological right. sign, maybe? Could be, maybe, <laughs> you know? The world works Mercury, in mysterious ways. Mercury. <laughs> right. Mercury got everyone to take their applications, you know, that they were, you know, holding on the shelf at their lawyer's office and they decided to all file them this week. Um, you know, or they know something that other people don't, or they were instructed, you know, to or told that the SEC was going to change its regulatory process regarding Bitcoin spot ETFs. But whatever it was, every single firm had an application ready to go and they all filed them at pretty much the exact same time. So this week has been just a drumbeat of institutions entering crypto with registered products, which again is exactly what the SEC has always indicated that the concept it wants. It wants people to file prospectuses for you know investment products and you know disclose the risks and create new things. And so there's now this the wave of institutions that believe that the time is right. And so you know, it'll be really interesting to see over the next couple of weeks which get approved. It's possible every single one of them gets approved. <laughs> and there's just an army of different choices for consumers to be able to purchase Bitcoin and have it held in an ETF or trust structure. So pretty exciting time. Um, but we're going to have to wait and see to see what the actual outcome is, because the applications alone fundamentally don't mean anything. So, again, I, I don't know anything about how these processes work, but uh, beyond just what I've observed over the last few years of seeing things repeatedly get rejected. But it, it seems plausible to me that the reason why all these folks have come out of the woodwork is that the SEC is basically ready to backpedal. Uh, they, they see that this case, the GBTC lawsuit that was that is going live is not going well for them. And they see kind of sentiment turning in Congress against the way that the SEC has been regulating the industry. Um, and rather than have it be basically the market is owned by Grayscale or these crypto folks, it, it's plausible to me that they reached out to uh, you know, very high quality ETF sponsors that the SEC knows how to regulate very well and basically said, look, 
why don't you guys come in the market? I think this thing is ready to go. And we, re we really don't want it to be just Grayscale out here, you know, basically attracting deposits. We'd like to have a more regulated counterparty to be, to be working with in having these products out there. Right, which rugs Grayscale essentially. You know, if they were going to get approved judicially <laughs> and be the only product out there, they might not be first to market. They might be last to market. Well, the other thing that's kind of weird is like, I feel like some of the speculation I've read, and like, again, I, I have no information that is real or advantaged in any way about this, is that this would basically force Grayscale to sell to one of, basically sell their holdings to one of these if they got approved first, because it would just be like, otherwise they would, wouldn't have be able to exit very easily. Um, and like all the creditors and stuff would just push DCG into selling it because like, that these funds would obviously want those funds immediately. So do you, do you mean selling the underlying assets or selling the actual product, like actual GBTC? No, no, trust? no, the underlying assets, like dissolving the trust, selling it and returning the proceeds and returning it to the, the right. Like dissolving it and you basically you get a BlackRock share in for that. That makes sense. So you sort of rewrap all the underlying assets and, and yeah. give them back to And the argument for the only reason I said this is all the there are a lot of people who who are like trade that the spread, the discount to nav for grayscale. Where this was their thesis was that the reason it's going to zero, like people are think it'll converge is because the court system will take forever. But if this gets approved, basically the fastest thing that could happen is actually some type of forced acquisition like this. Is there a precedent um, for that? Has that happened before? I, I don't, this is where I don't know, but this is what people who love trading GBTC spreads were saying. So, like, <laughs> I have no clue if that's like a, you know, they they were very informed on this, or this was like a, you know, Reddit style conspiracy theory. Yeah, it, it does feel kind of like a a slap to the face of DCG of like if you think about you know why we've had some of these defaults and why they're kind of in the position that they're in. It's like people getting trapped underwater in. Uh, uh, the GPTC trade, um, which obviously they have, you know, facilitate through through Genesis, and now it's like, well, you know, even if you basically are, you know, allowed to have this ETF conversion that would have solved the problem in the first place, um, you know, you don't actually get to benefit from it because uh, you know BlackRock is sort of sweeping it out from from under you and like pretty much collapsing the value of Grayscale. So it's it's like they just can't uh, uh, win to an extent. Right, and just to be extremely clear, right, GBTC and the Grayscale products have been a toxic financial product that tens of billions of dollars have flowed into over the last couple of years. You know, the fact that you can't redeem from the product and you're charged exorbitant fees, 2% to literally just total Bitcoin or Ether, that's not a good financial product. And the only reason it worked is because at one point it traded for a premium due to supply and demand imbalance and assets rushed in. But like, Fundamentally, the Grayscale Trusts are a toxic product that have not been good for the investors, the industry, and it really was the root cause of a lot of the things that blew up, right? 3AC and the ripple effects and just, you know, it's been an absolute calamity. And really, like, alternatives to GPTC and the Grayscale Trusts should have been approved a long time ago, and it would have been healthier for everybody. It would have been healthier for investors, healthier for the market, healthier for competitors, and it's just really sad that there's never been any actual competition on that front. And the only product that's been traded is a toxic product. That's such a good point, Robert. Like so much of the damage over the last year could have been avoided if this product basically was arbitrage out of existence. It's, it's, a, it's a testament to the fact that market efficiency creates so much more stability than, than you know, maintaining these inefficient markets. I do feel bad to some degree for... To, I, I do feel bad to some degree for Grayscale because clearly Grayscale, they are in some sense the people who push the envelope with the SEC to force their hand to have to uh, approve. I mean, again, we might be jumping the gun, but to approve uh, a Bitcoin ETF. And it seems overwhelming that they're not going to be the beneficiary of that. Um, that said, they they got paid plenty in the years that they essentially had a monopoly on being that you know exchange traded product. The interesting detail about, uh, I don't know if you guys have any color on this, the interesting detail of why the SEC has claimed that they've rejected all these previous uh, Bitcoin spot products is because they don't have these market surveillance, uh, mar you know, market surveillance agreements. 
And uh, BlackRock supposedly has this. This is the one thing that, the one place where they diverge from previous applications. And the same thing is true for Wisdom Tree and for Invesco, is that now they have these surveillance sharing agreements in place. It was always a little bit unclear why this mattered. That seemed like always a little bit of a red herring, given that Bitcoin is such a massively traded product everywhere in the world. Um, you know, the, 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 the degree to which you can actually have these surveillance sharing agreements with the biggest spot market, which is Binance, presumably, is, you know, the way that, the way that we calculate the indices for what the spot price is, is also, you know, uses a bunch of different exchanges. So I, I don't totally understand the details of why this was such a sticking point for the SEC, but it seems like now it's been overcome. Uh, and that, that should at least uh, address the nominal protest that the SEC gave to all the previous products that were in place. So in one sense, having a, having a spot product as well as a futures product, so there's a spot, pro, a spot ETF, futures ETF, Futures ETF, although technically you could get access to Bitcoin exposure, a futures ETF is just a much more complex product. It does weird things when the futures are going to roll over and stuff. And it's just not as retail friendly. It's not as straightforward as just a super low cost ETF. There's no rolling. There's no fanciness. There's super low fees because it's just a big pile of Bitcoin that you can hold on any you know US exchange. Well, I mean, also the other advantage they had was like it, it was one of the few ways to express crypto exposure in a retirement account, which seemed to be like one of the biggest drivers of volume, right? So yeah, I, I'm more surprised the vanguards of the world haven't, you know, or like Fidelity, right? If they like built a custodian, like you would think they would have tried. I think Fidelity has a custodian. No, no, no. As in they would have tried to make an ETF. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. they, they have so much captive investment retirement, like customer, a customer base that's easy to sell to. Instead, they went for all these like weird stuff, like, well, backed maybe forgettable exposure but you know uh but like i mean you know obviously their custody and stuff has done well but i'm just surprised they they you know someone like them who seemed to have first mover advantage didn't you know wasn't one of the names we saw are, are there any stats for actually how much is in custody at fidelity in crypto assets don't know be interesting yeah so th the other thing about this etf story so obviously it's it's caused bitcoin to cross 30k eth is at 1800 uh, markets are, are are rallying on uh, on on this news basically to a level we haven't seen since April. The interesting thing is, that, you know, the sentiment shift seems really dramatic. Basically, a week ago we assumed that crypto had just become untouchable by U.S. institutions, and now all of a sudden you have even larger U.S. institutions who had who had not messed with crypto seriously in quite a while. Now all of a sudden entering the fray and signaling some seriousness about uh, thinking this is a market worth going after. The other side of that news is that last week there was a story that A16Z which of course is one of the largest venture funds in crypto, or I'm sorry, the largest venture fund in crypto. Um, they were creating a new office for A16Z Crypto, their crypto arm, in London, and claiming that they believed that London was going to be the new crypto capital of Europe, uh, and perhaps that there was going to be more and more founders leaving the US and moving over into the UK. What, what did you guys think of the story about you know, London potentially being this new crypto hub within Europe or potentially siphoning talent away from the U.S., especially in light of what we're seeing now this week? Well, I mean, first of all, it's entirely plausible, right? The primary argument being that even after everyone has filed ETF applications over the past week, there have been zero actual signs of any regulatory framework actually moving forward or any additional clarity whatsoever moving forward. You know, seeing all these institutions get excited is creates a lot of hope, but nothing has fundamentally changed last week to this week, besides a ton of institutions demonstrating their interest in this. But there's always been interest in having crypto financial products. You know, the UK and a lot of Europe and a lot of Asia is actually creating a regulatory framework for crypto to flourish, period. Not opacity and like questionable things. It's just they're actually moving forward and trying to be welcoming and encouraging of innovation. And I think what led to A16Z, you know, creating a UK office is the fact that all of the most primary US-based businesses in crypto have already over the past couple of months started moving offshore. Coinbase has started moving offshore. Gemini has started moving offshore. Like all of these things that we think of as like the US bedrock of crypto have been moving offshore in response to regulatory overreach in many cases. And, you know, that's, we have an exact opposite environment in the UK. 
you know, their prime minister was touting the fact that, you know, he's trying to create like a crypto friendly country. And over time, if you're an entrepreneur deciding where you're going to create something new, there's a ton of evidence that you should be doing it in the UK or doing it in some other country that's like extremely welcoming. And so, you know, I think Andreessen just sees the writing on the wall and sees that there's going to be more and more entrepreneurship, you know, having a focal point in the UK or Europe in general, and is trying to, you know, skate to where the puck is going and change their approach, you know, and probably going to be correct. There's probably going to be a lot more investment opportunities for them, you know, for entrepreneurs in the UK and Europe. So I think it was a brilliant move. I think they're doing what, you know, capitalism and regulation in the US have forced them to do. And I think they're doing it because they're profit motivated and they see the writing. An interesting angle on this is I, I agree with you. It's very clear the UK is trying to position itself as being this new haven within Europe. Um, I, I kind of imagine that, look, when you're at the scale of A16Z, it's also, you can you can sort of hedge a little bit and say like, look, you know, I mean, right now it's basically only one partner who's going over there. The rest of the team, as far as I know, is still stateside. Um, you can hedge a little bit, but also I feel like part of it, you know, so, so there were there was these hearings last week uh, at the House Financial Su uh, Services Subcommittee um, and they were basically going through some of the some of the recent events that were happening in crypto. And this thing about the um, about A6 and Z going uh, opening an office in, in London, this was brought up a couple times as an indication that like, hey, this is a sign that we're messing things up, right? We, we have the biggest venture firm in crypto now going overseas and talking about how great the UK is as opposed to the US as being a, a place to, to, to fund startups. I have to imagine that part of their motivation for this was guilt tripping the US. And it seems to be working to the extent that you know, it's it's one thing to say, like, well, they're going to Singapore, they're going to Dubai, like they sound kind of shady to an American congressperson. But if you tell a congressperson, like, oh no, London is stealing our jobs and they're taking our investments and our startups, and you know, these smart people are going over there instead of over here, the the fact that it's it, that it's the UK, and obviously our, our relationship with the UK is such that we we don't want to lose to them in particular. I think this is actually a very brilliant move at the low cost of just you know opening an office and and moving one person over. Do, well, I, I, I guess my question is like, has it been working? Like you, you made it sound like it, there already has been, I mean, I feel like there were a couple nice PR articles and like the prime minister said, I'm something. talking about the way it came across to Congress people. They brought it up several they, they times during the up? hearings. Yes. They oh, brought really? it up several okay, times okay, during okay. the hearings as venture capital firms are moving overseas to the UK because we do not have a regulatory framework. That is the way it's being kind of digested by Congress, which is great. Well, I mean, the reality is entrepreneurs have been <laughs> moving out of the U.S. for years and no one has given a shit. Like, frankly, like, it's amazing that, you know, every time people have been like, entrepreneurs have been moving offshore, it's like, well, it doesn't matter, you know, just, you know, two guys in a garage, who cares? But like, as soon as a venture firm does it, it's like, <laughs> oh my goodness, the venture capitalists are moving offshore. Now we have to pay attention. But like, this has been happening. And like, I don't think anyone in Congress cared when Coinbase and Gemini and like the biggest businesses were the ones who actually are the job creators moving offshore. It's just, you know, it, it's a little bit annoying because like, you know, people have been like making a stink about this by like trying to demonstrate the reality of how much more difficult the U.S. was for a foundation for innovation than other countries for years now. On the other hand, investors do more lobbying or like more targeted lobbying. Investors so like, it's, more not, lobbying, right? it's not, it's not like it's like, oh, it's not like it like randomly happened is I guess what I'm saying, right? It's like the companies are usually a little more inept at being able to do that type. So because it's not in the DNA of like a founder to be like, yes, I want to go lobby. Like, and the companies are naturally more be. suspect. Yeah. The, yeah. Like, it just like never works that way, right? Right. Tom, you were going to add something? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I think the entrepreneurs are really the ones to focus on here. Like you can still invest into European or British startups from the US. Like nothing precludes you from, from, from doing that. But obviously, if you want to base your operations and team um, outside the US, that's obviously much more important. And, and where your base is, 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 uh, uh, much more important to how you think about, you know, a regulatory uh, or which regulations you fall under. So I, I agree. It feels a bit uh, showy, but I mean, I guess people are paying attention. 
and they should encourage it so that they can tax it later. Like, <laughs> yeah. So it, it, well, it's good to see the UK kind of taking on the Singapore strategy, which I guess kind of the UK is becoming more and more the Singapore of uh, Europe, where it's sort of this, you know, it's like, okay, we can kind of get away from EU governance. We can kind of set some rules, make it attractive for capital flows. Um, otherwise, like domestically, there's not that much going on. Um, well, the rest of their economy is kind of like in decline right now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so they're very much taking the Singapore strategy of just like, let's just have great governance and great, you know, kind of financial capital. And besides that, like, yeah, it, otherwise things are kind of a mess. Well, also they haven't had a, a premier who is a mercantilist until recently, right? Like they've kind of had these like bozos for a long time as their leaders. I mean, so have we, right? Like the U.S. has had bozos too, but I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to... It's not pot con kettle black. I think Trump was very mercantilist, actually. Yeah, are you like saying that because Rishi's a Stanford grad, or is there something uh, deeper on your mind there? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he, he clearly worked in finance for a while. I feel like he's much more attuned to this than Boris. B Boris can't even like tie his shoes correctly. Like it's it's kind of a it's like not hey, even Boris, a first Boris was no dummy. Let me say that Boris was actually he was no dummy. Boris. He was he definitely had street smarts. He but Boris was like LBJ. I don't think he was like uh you know a, a, a trying to do the Singapore strategy. I mean Boris was not just like some LBJ. He was actually an incredibly intelligent, literate, and thoughtful politician. Like I don't think he gets enough credit. In that regard, but like he actually was incredibly smart. He certainly didn't seem like it when he was in office. I I, I agree. His like history like looks good, but I I I'm 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 certainly not a, a Boris fan. Let's say the chopping block will pivot into UK politics next. Yeah, time. I'm like I I'm following zero of this. I've seen so <laughs> well, little okay, okay. of any of this Actually, stuff. can I ask? Can I ask you guys a question? Like, of all the British companies that you can think of in the last twenty years. Which one do you give a shit about in 2023? And there's only one I can think of personally, which is TransferWise. DeepMind? DeepMind, TransferWise. Yeah, those are like the two. I, it's I actually kind of hard to think of that many British com companies. Well, this is why they actually need to encourage innovation. Like I read a crazy stat, which was like, you know, the amount of new IPOs, you know, in London is like anemic compared to like historical averages. There's just like no new companies really going public in the UK. And when they do, the returns have been like mediocre. Like the new issuance has been like really, really bad. And hopefully we can pull up some stats or something on this. But like, you know, that's the leading indicator for saying like, hey, we need to like rethink this and open our doors to entrepreneurs and capital and like get this mojo going here in the UK. Well, this is the Singapore thing too, right? Like if, if your local economy and your demographics and like your trade relations are kind of crap, but you can compete on being like, hey, this is a great financial market on which to IPO or to attract your entrepreneurs and like set up your headquarters here. It's kind of what Dublin has been historically, especially for tech companies. Like obviously that is, I mean, that's more of like tax arbitrage than it is like actual about governance and financial markets. But I think I can, I can see the UK nestling into that kind of a position and using that to solidify its importance internationally. Because otherwise, I, I think I think London, the UK broadly has been kind of fighting against its, its decline for the last 20 years. And I feel like at a certain point you have to, no, <laughs> definitely not 400, definitely War not 400. Of 1812. Say, War of 1812 was like the beginning. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, fine, fine, fine. But um, at a certain point you kind of accept that, okay, we're just like kind of a, a lonely island with bad demographics and like, you know, and we still it, fund we still fund our, that, our 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 royals excesses with public. Yeah, exactly. Money. I mean that 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 stuff is all very bizarre <laughs> to me as well. But once you accept that, and you're like, cool, what do we do with this? You know, and you sort of take the Singapore attitude of, hey, we don't need to be the center of the universe, but let's like find something that we can be really really strong at. Anyway, it's it's a good sign at the very well, least. Well, I, I I do think the they have an extremely well educated STEM populace for for this kind of thing compared to like uh, virtually any other candidate for try someone trying to do this. So I think they're in good shape there. I mean, I also feel like France was also trying to do a little bit of stuff like this, but then Binance had an office in France or something or yeah, didn't, didn't office. Paris just kick out Binance. Yeah. Apparently they just, yeah. But th there were all these people saying like France is the future for crypto. And like, clearly I don't no, know. No, that was because, 
people were saying that DeFi was the future of finance, no, no, and then it became no, no. the future of France. No, 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 no. But then all the same particular DeFi, French DeFi people from 2020, all were shilling on Twitter in the last six months, being like, "Oh, look, like Binance coming to 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 to." France is like the greatest thing ever. And like, how oh, you living there is amazing. And like, look, we're going to be like the crypto heaven. And it's like, uh, really? I don't think so. France is not bacon. That's the lesson. <laughs> yes. Um, anyway, okay. Right. So, 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 so my last question is, are, are you going to move there, Hasib? you going to move to, to, no, to it, it, what would it take? What would it take? Like, what would you need to see for it to be like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to Britain. I'm, I'm going to yeah, learn to well, eat okay, the bad I, food. If it was, yeah, I mean, first of all, Britain, I mean, not to hate on any, I don't know if any of our listeners are in the UK, but Britain is just like, it's so, it's so like the weather is so crappy. It's so depressing. People there are just like unfriendly. I, I, I would really fight going to the UK. I feel like Lisbon would be more doable. I could do Lisbon and then like, you know, commute or something. So here's the thing. If you remember before COVID, the standard game for DeFi founders or founders in general would be you, you, you have a team in the U.S., you go to Switzerland and that's where you incorporate and you do your ICO and you do your blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you might have a tech team in the U.S., but there's like, you know, this sort of legal separation between the token issuer and the tech team. I would be very surprised if something like that does not continue in one form or another, unless the SEC is extremely aggressive about establishing U.S. Nexus, which so far they haven't been quite so aggressive um, on like where the tech people are. It's more about, you know, if you advertise here, if you, you know, do stuff domestically and you attract U.S. customers. It seems to be most of what they care about. I, I would assume that that's going to continue in in shape. If it doesn't, and if we see that basically people are like, look, well, I have to move everyone to the U.K. and that's the only way that I can do this. Then I, I, would, I would need to see it for at least a year and a half, right? By the time we see the 2024 uh, presidency, roll over and we have some, some clarity on whether or not this regime of being anti-crypto is going to continue in the U S that would probably be the moment where I can really seriously consider making a move. Otherwise it feels, um, it feels potentially transient, right? There've been a lot of places that were that crypto hub for like a year. And then it kind of moved over and people moved on because people in crypto are obviously very mobile, right? The fact that people can even be thinking about going to the UK means that they can be thinking of going somewhere else a year later. So, that's, that's the way that I would think about it. But um, the reality too, is that there's still going to be a lot of activity that is uh, in Asia rather than in Europe, right? So I think if you're Andreessen, it naturally makes sense to like, hey, the, look, we kind of covered the Anglophone market. That's kind of always been our bread and butter. And the reality too, you know, is, to be honest, you don't need to be in the UK, like Tom mentioned, to actually see UK deals, right? Like we, you know, at Dragonfly, we see deals basically from any, anybody who speaks English, you can get your deck to us via Twitter or via Gmail or whatever. Uh, and so it's traditionally been the case that whether or not, whether you're in the UK, whether you're in Germany, whether you're in, you know, Australia, you see all the same VCs, right? Because everybody kind of lives on Twitter and they don't necessarily know where you are until they actually, you know, get on the call and ask you. So uh, I don't think that that really changes that much of the calculus for a venture capitalist unless something really dramatically changes, which is possible, but I think it's too early to say. So the, the other big news last week, you know, speaking of all the stuff going on with regulation, was about this firm called Prometheum. So this became a bit of a Twitter witch hunt hullabaloo. So last week when the House Financial Services Subcommittee did their hearing on digital assets, uh, they, they had a, a number of witnesses that they interrogated about you know, what was going on in the industry. And one of them was this gentleman from a firm called Prometheum, which is the first SEC approved special purpose broker dealer to trade digital asset securities. Okay, so what the hell does that mean? Special purpose broker dealer is basically a broker dealer license where you can trade. You have, you have some special abilities that normal broker dealers don't have. Uh, that's my understanding. They were the first and only one that's ever been approved for digital asset securities. Now, the problem with this is that digital asset securities as a concept do not exist. There are no registered digital asset securities. So uh, this person, you know, basically they went on stage and they were kind of a, they were, they were basically like an SEC shill effectively. They were advocating for the importance of the SEC being the, the regulator of choice for the digital asset industry. They basically backed the SEC and said, yes, everything in crypto is a security. All these tokens are securities. They should not be uh, traded by retail investors. They should, they should register and file disclosures and all this stuff. 
Uh, there are all these scams in the industry and the industry needs to be uh, protected. Uh, or retail investors need to be protected from the industry. And, uh, but then as he got interrogated by Congress, Congress started pulling out, some of the Congress people who were asking him questions, started pulling out some weird stuff about his exchange. So for example, uh, they raised a $50 million Reg A plus to issue a token, which is kind of weird because there is no token and their website has been scrubbed of any mentions of a token. They raised $48 million with uh, Wan Xiang, uh, which is a group affiliated with a, with a fund called Hashkey, that invested into them. And uh, they, uh, now Wan Xiang, Hashkey, they have connections to the CCP, which is kind of strange. And, and they, they mentioned that they went through uh, uh, an investigation by CFIUS, which is the group that checks out these kind of weird, you know, international connections. Um, but th nothing happened. Their broker through which they raised this $48 million was a group called Network One Financial Securities, which was the broker behind the Long Island blockchain ICT pivot, has a track record of a ton of regulatory violations, basically super shady for whatever reason. Now, and, and the, the most obvious thing that's very strange about this company is that you can't trade anything on Prometheum. Now, what I mean, you can't trade anything. You cannot trade Bitcoin. You cannot trade Ether. You cannot trade stable coins. You cannot trade Solana or Compound or whatever. Actually, ironically enough, they list Compound on the site as though Compound is something that you could trade, but you, you can't, of course, because Compound is not registered with the SEC as a digital asset security. So there is nothing actually that can be done with this platform. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, weird questions because there are some connections from the team to people who work formally at the SEC or work with various agencies. So now there are questions of like, why did the SEC approve this guy with no real track record, no real business, uh, no real ability to trade anything and have this person go in front of Congress and basically say, this is so great. The SEC should uh, should do everything. Why can't you just do what we did? You and forgot the best the part. You forgot the best part. Everyone What's who the best works part? at Prometheum who has a law degree got a law degree from a place that is not... Um, accredited by He's the no American bar. <laughs> I thought that was the best part of the story. <laughs> yes. So um, it's a really bizarre situation and a bunch of Twitter sleuths, Matt Walsh in particular, were able to track down a lot of this information uh, after the hearings. But basically the entire internet is now awash with people trying to figure out what is going on here. It's super, Wait, super conspiracy weird. Conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory. So you know how you're talking about how like, hey, the SEC was like the one who like tried to nudge BlackRock. Maybe they did this as a way to, to, because they got so much bad press from Prometheum. They're like, BlackRock, go, 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 distract everyone. <laughs> I mean, it's entirely possible. You know? <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but it's, I don't know what is, if that, it's not that crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the Blockchain Association just filed a FOIA request. So the SEC is going to have to share exactly what led them to decide to approve this, this group given all the weirdness behind them and also the fact that there there was really there there doesn't seem to be any business plan as far as one can tell even though they raised a giant pile of money i don't think the issue is approving this group i think the issue is approving this group and not approving anybody else including reputable businesses with long successful track records like coinbase that were trying to get approved to be able to get these licenses and approving prometheum but not existing entities with credibility and a track record and all of these things. That's the part that boggles the mind. You know, I, I, I think there should be approvals for organizations like Prometheum. I think there should be way more of them. I don't think Prometheum, which is like, you know, red flags out the wazoo should be for whatever reason, the only entity that's ever been giving this type of license. That's the astounding part. Well, so the red flags are, are comical, but I think the the core point, as you're mentioning, Robert, I, I don't even know that it's so much that, okay, Prometheum got approved and other people didn't. It's more that the story the SEC is telling is that if you just come in and register, then you can run this business in a legal way. Well, this is what that looks like. This is what the SEC thinks that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do what Prometheum did and launch an exchange that cannot trade anything. Literally, there is no asset that can be traded on this platform. So what is the point of them securing the special purpose broker dealer when it basically means that their business is, is, is dead? There is nothing that can be done on this platform. They have to sit around and wait for the SEC to approve other digital asset securities so that they can be traded on this platform without any knowledge of what those will be or whether there is even a path for the digital assets that people want to trade. Like, you know, the SEC has claimed that Solana is a digital asset security. Okay, how does Solana register? There is no, there is no explanation. There is no story, there's no path. It has never happened. Um, so 
That I think is really the crux of the problem. It's not just that, hey, why did you approve Prometheus and not approve Coinbase? If they told Coinbase, well, you could just do what Prometheum did. That is a non-answer. That is basically saying, look, you must, you know, don't do your business. It's essentially a way of, it's a sort of Kafka-esque doublespeak. Instead of saying, no, you token. cannot do this. What's that? It's a soul bound token. <laughs> you own the <laughs> right to, uh, to be non-transferable. <laughs> I'm, I'm missing that analogy. Yeah, did uh, not follow that. I, it, was a bad, it was a bad joke about like, hey, like I bought this thing. You can't do any trading with it. But look, I can show you like I bought this thing. Like a sold oh, out. I, I see. Okay. Game. All right. All right. It's, it's a PO app for showing up at the SEC's office. Yes. And paying a lot of money. But they're the only yeah. ones who got that PO app. Yes. yes. This, that's yes. the other thing. No it's one, one else of got one. The one of one. One of one. Right. Right. Yeah. So the, the, the other story from the um, kind of regulated exchange side is this exchange called EDX. So EDX, they were funded, I believe last year by Sitsec, uh, Cit Citadel Securities, Fidelity, Schwab, as well as Paradigm and, and Sequoia um, and Virtue and a few other groups. And they are now launching a, basically like sort of a TradFi exchange. So it's a, it's a non-custodial exchange, but when they say non-custodial, they don't mean DeFi non-custodial, they mean non-custodial in the traditional sense, which is that there is a custodian that will hold your funds and they are just the, you know, basically they do the uh, the actual trading and the execution, the matchmaking, but the 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 clearing happens on your custodian. Um, so this is a members only exchange. This is not something that you can just you know show up, install the iOS app, and start trading. Um, this is something basically for financial institutions to be able to trade. Uh, they can trade Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, and Bitcoin Cash, which they're now. I guess there's some confidence now that e e you know Ether is not a security. I guess because it's being uh, traded on, on this platform. Any, any thoughts on this one? I don't know if anyone. So I, I think I, I have a, a hot take that, that maybe, maybe you, you may Please. or may not agree with, which I think any venture funded exchange in that's targeting traditional finance people has completely failed in many different levels. Like everything from the Eric Ries thing, which like never fucking took off the, you know, the lean startup is about, Making the lean startup is about a book by Eric Ries about like how you should like be very uh, minimalistic when making a startup. He didn't take his own advice. He uh, he took ten years to make this exchange that has like negligible market share at best. And it was, it was called like the Good Exchange or something, right? The, yeah, something like, like that. That was the long-term long -term stock exchange. Long-term, long -term, yeah. long-term, 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 all of these kind of like people who are in 2017 raising money, you know, like Binance and then sort of FTX were the only real survivors that made real exchanges. And neither of them had like tons of venture funding to, uh, uh, and off the ground. But then there are these people who raised tons of money in 2018 to do crypto exchanges. And some of them were institutional, some weren't, dot, dot, dot. All of them kind of hit the, hit the hay. Uh, I think the other thing is like anyone who offers Bitcoin Cash is just never going to make it. Like, who the <laughs> fuck? Give, who the fuck trades Bitcoin Cash? What are you doing? Just like taking the other side of Roger Ver's bad loans? Like always? Like I don't understand. The Bitcoin Cash part is a mystery. It does seem a little um, off the mark for what institutions in the U.S. want to be trading, but um, I don't know. It doesn't cost anything. Let to me add tell it, you, I, I, I want. I once recently had the misfortune of looking at Roger Ver's Instagram, and so I, I'll, I'll tell you, you're always taking the other side of Roger Ver. You're increasing his his lifestyle habits by trading Bitcoin Cash. I see. I, I mean, I agree with you that uh, these do not have a good track record. Obviously, almost all these institutional exchanges have belly flopped immediately. The difference now might be that a lot of these institutions just might be scared to trade on Coinbase at this point. And this might be the moment that there is, there's actually enough legs to this thing that, especially with the custody rule uh, now, you know, getting closer to being enforced by the SEC, as well as the, the you know, the, the frontal assault on Coinbase, there's at least a path to be being able to, to create enough liquidity for this kind of thing to potentially work. Um, I do think that the venture returns are probably not going to be there. I mean, this was funded in like uh, early 2022, I think. So it was near the height of the market that, th that this company was funded. So I doubt this is going to be a great return for anyone, even if they are successful at gaining institutional traction within the U.S. You have to bet on the market growing a lot among institutions for this thing to really be. U.S.-based institutions. U.S.-based institutions. Like, like right. not, yeah. Like, I, it just like feels a little too. 
little and too especially late. Especially if the exchange is only doing matching, like matching at high throughput is not something that like you earn 1% on, <laughs> right? Like exchanges yeah. are hard and have like a moat and market share because like they do all the things right now. Like they do the custody and the matching and the settlement and the everything, right? Well, they're supposed to be, EDX supposed to actually open their own clearing agent. They're not going to use Apex or something like that. So like I, 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 they're trying to go for that vertically integrated play, to be fair. It's just like the licensing is like, you know, you're not going to get all of them at once. You're you're going to have to do it incrementally. But and that that is, they have said they want to do that. So I I, I will give them credit for that. There, they, it does seem like they're trying to. That makes sense. All right, I, I think that I think. I mean, we'll see what happens to EDX. I don't want to be too. Uh, I don't I don't want to guess too much because I think the thing just launched. So we'll see how things. I play just out. Don't, I don't understand how you think you're going to make money with Bitcoin Cash listed. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, to be clear, so Bitcoin Cash other, is ripping right now. There's so many other things I would offer. I would offer like Lido. What can you offer? You can't. You cannot offer Lido. Are you serious? No, no, like Steeth, not 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 Lido, the token. Okay, okay. Uh, I mean, if BUSD is a security according to the SEC, would not STETH also be a security? You got to take chances and risk. <laughs> Bitcoin Cash is not a risk. I mean, look, I I, I don't agree with the SEC's characterization, but. I, I really think that, I mean, this is kind of it. The only other thing you can add is Doge, right? And then maybe stable coins. Sure. That Doge even seems more favorable. <laughs> like, this is just such a boomer exchange. They didn't even, like, try to attract anything that younger buyers would ever want. I mean, look, this basically, minus XRP, this used to be the Coinbase lineup before, um, For what sure. was it, 20 I'm, I'm happy we all took a time machine backwards in time and pretended nothing <laughs> happened. Like, great. <laughs> Uh, look, Litecoin, I, I just tweeted about this yesterday. Litecoin still does more volume than Solana or Polygon or, you know, almost anything in, uh, that, that people actually use. The Litecoin is still Litecoin, absolutely Litecoin, I'm massive. fine. Litecoin, I'm fine. Bitcoin Cash is the one where I'm like, what? Yeah, Bitcoin Cash, I mean, Bitcoin Cash is a bit, a bit of a mystery, but, you know, yeah. Cool. Last story I want to get to and, and to ruin this one, uh, this one especially for you. So uh, last week there was a big kerfuffle in DeFi around Aave. So Aave, of course, biggest uh, on-chain lending market. Um, there is a token called CRV, which is a token of Curve Protocol. And the founder of Curve, Michael Igorov, he had a big outstanding loan. He had borrowed 60 million plus of uh, stable coins against 288 million CRV, which is worth about 180 million. So he had 60 million borrowed against 180 million of collateral. Now, the problem with this, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty healthy loan, uh, all things equal. The problem with this is that there's only 850 million CRV in existence and about 300 of that 850 million was locked into this loan. Meaning that if this loan were to be liquidated for whatever reason, if the curve price were to collapse, um, there is absolutely no way that any of this stuff could get liquidated for anywhere near what the market price would be just because of how, you know, it's, it's almost like a third of, or maybe more than a third of all of the outstanding CRV was locked into Aave in this single loan. So uh, Gauntlet, which is uh, Tarun's company, which I don't know, Tarun, maybe you want to explain what happened from here. Yeah, so basically, you know, we spent a lot of time monitoring these protocols and seeing like what, hey, like how much margin should they allow for a particular asset um, and, you know, what the interest rates should be and stuff like that based on a bunch of different sort of math factors and how the markets are behaving off-chain, how the markets are behaving on-chain, how much liquidity is in certain protocols, how much of the liquidity is locked in certain protocols? Um, and whether and Mercury astrology. is in retrograde. No astrology. No astrology. No astrology. <laughs> <laughs> the only, the only, the only thing that's uh, in common between what we do and astrology is the num as a prefix of numerology, as a subset. Does, does of Chainlink astrology. not report the status of Mercury anymore on Chain? You can't pull that in. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that does. You can. You can write it. And right now, I'm sure that exists somewhere. Um, okay, great. So basically, you know, one of the interesting things about Aave V2 is it doesn't really have supply caps. So the, the new versions do. And so because there's no supply cap, for especially for assets that were some of the earliest ones listed, um, they kind of aggregate supply over a while. And Igorov, uh, in a lot of ways, outside of being in the press for his new houses, um, also 
is probably one of the biggest, most active borrowers in all of DeFi in like every protocol. Like any single lending protocol that exists, you will find his addresses no matter what. Like he moved, he moved, he, he, you know, he, he, he king made some, some very random, like uh, tiny uh, fixed rate lender in response to the Save thing actually uh, the other day. But so, so long story short, it's it's kind of Curve is is one of the assets that like Ave grew a lot on, and so the community is actually extremely fond of this asset. It sort of has sentimental value to them because like during DeFi sentimental summer, sentimental value. There's sentimental value what? about re- not removing it. Is my point right? Like like it's it's kind of a badass to have. We you know for you can go through the governance proposals of many people, including us, being like we should stop allowing borrowing, remove it, do all this stuff. And the Ave community is actually has a lot of voices and a lot of them got rich off curve. And so they they have this sort of like, we could never huh. get rid of curve. There, there's like a little bit of that tendency you can sometimes see in people. Okay. Um, long story short, there was this point where curve liquidity was like basically non-existent. So like even though Egros positions net health factor, so health factor is like how much uh, collateral you have divided by how much you're borrowing and so the higher it is, the better, because it sort of says like, you know, your collateral, if you default on your loan, at least your collateral is worth at least significantly more and you're over collateralized. And most things in DeFi are over collateralized and uh, most things that are real that don't blow up. And I have to add that caveat after Luna. And so, you know, I think as people were freaking out about this, one thing um we did which is we we put up this proposal that failed but it 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 had the exact intended effect which is the proposal was to like restrict borrowing and basically you know like force the uh user to to adjust their position or take a loss and in the process just the act of the proposal being up led to igorov de-risking his position and then telling the block that he de-risked his position because he saw the proposal so DeFi governance, you know, I think is very different than than other DAO governance in crypto because it's very focused on these types of quite quite precise events. Um, but anyway, the main thing is curve liquidity wasn't there. So even though the, the the collateral factor looked good, if it had to be liquidated and you sold all that curve, you would cause the price to go down so much that the loan would spiral. Was there an estimate of like if the the position was liquidated, what would it actually be worth? Yeah, I think we in in some of the forum posts we put our simulation estimates and then like the realized estimates um, over time. But I think it was like around forty cents was forty two cents was the the, the worst so the, and forty two cents. But this thing was like more than two x over collateralized, so it would have been you know maybe it wasn't okay. Two, it wasn't two x. It was one point five five. And and also Igorov, you know, very. Um, interesting person but but i would say he uh he he's 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 probably one of the smartest users in DeFi. if you track his addresses he's constantly like rebalancing his portfolio to like stay at this particular health factor and i feel like he just has a script that's doing he's just like he it's it's like always in this one band but Mm. clearly he's rebalancing without taking it and liquidity into account which is why people are freaking out and so the interesting thing is putting a proposal that can make it hard for him to to adjust his position suddenly makes him delever and then like it then like uh, the market moved the other way so it it was it was an interesting kind of case study of of governance in that sense uh in the sense so that like, so the, the gauntlet proposal was to freeze the position not yeah. allow him to not, take not out freeze any other, his position freeze the market so people can't the keep market. At, yeah yeah freeze the CRV okay. market. So the market can no longer grow it can only contract Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. And okay. so by doing that, you make it hard to do these rebalances that that he was doing a lot of. And so right. so then he was like, okay, I should lower my risk in curve terms. And you know, if you followed on chain stuff, he was like withdrawing a bunch of fracks and a bunch of staked ETH and, and different assets and using that as collateral. And those are much more well, not the fracks part, but the because he the frax was for frax lines, but the staked ETH part is a much more reliable piece of collateral. So like at that health factor, if you had a liquidated a bunch of stake teeth, it would have been fine. There's tons of liquidity for it. Ironically, in curve, but he also, I mean, repaid a little bit of the loan, right? Like a few mil. Yeah. I think he said in Discord he like was liquid enough to repay the whole loan if he needed to, which is I guess kind of he a did, flex. He, but he did yeah. he did just buy these like forty million dollar houses in Australia. So and that like, is true. And yeah. like the memes were all about how like Ave is gonna be a real world asset exchange because like <laughs> it's secretly collateralized by Igorov's mansions and stuff like that. 
Wow. That is fascinating. I, w- the really interesting thing to me is why, why do you think the Ave community rejected the proposal? Well, because I, I, there's a philosophical thing against freezing and especially for Curve. I think like there have been a couple of times that we've done freeze proposals that have worked like whereas like the market was like like around the USDC DPEG, um, we sent a bunch of uh, freezes on Avalanche um, because Avalanche had native USDC and like the native versus synthetic USDC pools were completely out of whack and it was like impossible to liquidate a bunch of them. And so the community then was like very open to that. But, but again, I, there's, there's something interesting about the flavor of, of community driven finance where there is sentimental attachment to certain assets. Like, like it re- there is really, it is or, or sentimental apathy or even like, you know, anti antipathy in the sense of like people not putting tether anywhere in DeFi, right? Like that's, that's like a mm. unspoken rule, almost a, a sort of weird sort of lore astrological law let's say. Um, but, but, my, but my point is, uh, you know, there, there, there's a lot of this stuff and, and really, you know, understanding the, the needs of these communities. Of and, and this it's, happens at normal lenders too, for the record, like in the real world where they're like, uh, let's say I'm a commercial real estate lender uh, and commercial real estate is in the dumpster right now. Yet it's kind of hard for me to start, start doing loans in something I don't know because I, my underwriting process doesn't work or I'm like kind of, not you know so 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 sometimes you see similar types of behavior where people have some attachment. It's just funny in this case more because ninety percent of the revenue from this is coming from this one person who is also the creator of the token. So. Right, right. It's it's interesting because you could look at this and say, kind of in the way you're describing, of like, look, this is why direct democracy for something that's as technocratic as an on-chain lending protocol is kind of weird because people are going to make these emotional decisions about, oh no, CRV, I made all my money. Like it's very nostalgic. So let's not liquidate despite the fact that it's literally one dude borrowing, like, you know, basically buying houses with his CRV position. Oh, oh um, the, the best part is the loan is almost is like, is the close to the sum of the ho- property value. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That was like he the was. best part. He like bought a bunch <laughs> of houses. And if you add those up, the loan was only a tiny amount of margin. over that. Yeah. <laughs> the other side of it. Now, if you, if you take the other side of that and you steal man, um, why, why is it that these people rejected this? The steel man of it is that, okay, maybe the, the collective intelligence of Ave is that, look, Ave is not playing a one-shot game the way that Gauntlet might be modeling this as a one-shot game of like, oh, okay, the, the risk of default is this, blah, blah, blah. But when you have a, a great borrower who's been borrowing with you for a long time and a bunch of other protocols are going to take a signal from how you treat that borrower when that borrower is taking a lot of excessive risk, is sure. that, look, you can say cut you off, you know, look, you're out, you're out of, uh, out of bounds of the, of the loan contract, get the fuck out. And you know, we're not doing business anymore. Or sure. you can say like, look, I understand where things are going. You're having a tough time. Like I'm going to extend you a little bit of extra wiggle all room. I have to, all I have to say is people in the beginning were not like that, right? They, they were right. once but, the but position I, actually started going. I'm, like, I'm like, saying like, maybe I, we can I, give I, them credit that that's what was going on sure, sure, through sure. the collective intelligence of the Ave governance community. I, I, I will I will say it, it didn't quite start that way. It started with the, <laughs> the like panic freeze now. And the most important thing from our perspective was like, hey, actually, if this just works as a, 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 a thing to get the user to change their behavior, then it kind of already did. You don't even need the to freeze the market. Right? Yeah, but, very fair. Very fair. So and, they, and they will be in, that in, it's in, both. In old school Bitcoin um, academic lend, there's a thing for this called a feather fork. And feather forking is this idea of like a group of miners, say like a big mining pool, telling everyone that they're going to reject a particular fork. And if there's a sufficient size, the probability that other people will try to continue on on that fork, they measure their EV and it goes to zero, provided the pool size is large enough, but it doesn't need to be 50%. It's actually less. And so there's the idea of like, hey, the feather fork, the minority can scare the the users into the fork. It, it sort of had this, it reminded me of that. And that, I thought that was right. kind of a funny. It's, it's funny. a little bit like sending a strongly worded email, you know, where <laughs> yeah. it's like, it's not quite the same thing as putting someone in default, sure. but it's sort of like, Hey, we noticed that your position yes. is done. Yes. 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 You, yes. you know, like, like this. It is a little more. <laughs> it is a little Exactly. Little. Exactly. It's a little bit like a three arrows default, right? Where like you don't actually put them in default, but you're just sort of like, hey, do Yo, you, are you sure? Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh exactly. my God. But, and hey, but, that but, stuff works. But, you know, three arrows clearly uh, has seemingly come back from the dead, according to the internet. 
speaking of them. I mean, yes. they had a New York Times puff piece, you know? But now they have a new fund. Did, it, did anyone know any details about it? I just saw Twitter hullabaloo, but I, I don't know actually what, anything about this fund. 3AC Ventures, it's new. It's not 3AC, it's 3AC Ventures. That's right, that's right. Which is the part of their book that obviously did the best, is... Uh, all the stuff I, I feel like I feel like I would change the logo to the right, like three AC, and then add a D in parentheses next to the C and a, a V. In there, there, is, there is so much they like could adventures. do to make it to be to be like to take the humor in stride about three AC coming back from the dead. But it seems like they were just very, you know, just is if kind of. I, I I would instead uh, think that they should make something called three AC Adventures, where they take everyone on tourism tours through all the fancy. Exotic locations, sir. <laughs> the best way to see Bali is uh, <laughs> the best way to is see Bali is the adventures. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that yeah. sounds amazing. <laughs> it sounds pretty good. What was the fruit that they talked about? Uh, there's like oh, you just got to eat strawberries or something. What was it? I missed. I don't that remember. Part. In the New York Times article, uh, there was fatty right. pork belly, but I don't know. Was yeah, it, yeah, okay, yeah, that was one yeah. of the things they talked about. That was one of the things they talked about. Anyway, all right, I think we're up on time, um, but uh, we'll be back next week, hopefully. Uh, Hopefully things are, are turning around for our good old pals in the crypto industry. Until then, thanks everybody. <laughs> <laughs>